So if you followed the channel for a while, you know I've always been a cannon shooter, and I just recently picked up this Nikon Z9 because I got tired of waiting on the Canon R1. And it's been about three months that I've had this camera, so it's time to do a video on what I love and what I hate about this camera. And also, do I regret buying it? And how's the Frankenstein set up using the Nikon body with the Canon lenses? And of course, this is the Nikon Z400 4.5 that I'm testing. I'll have a review on this soon. But uh, anyway, let's talk about it. I planned on shooting this video out here in the great outdoors, but as you can see, it's snowing right now. It's been from heavy to light, and it's just kind of miserable out here. But I do have some river riders down here in the creek that I'm going to go follow for a while and see what I can get out of them with this uh, Z9 with this 404.5 lens. And then we're going to head back to the house and do this review because there's no way I can do this out here today because it is just miserable. So after I do that, we'll head back to the house. Maybe I'll show you what I got with the river riders, and we'll talk about this camera. I'll talk to you here in just a bit. We are back at the house and uh, a little more warmed up than I was out there. But so to level set this camera, this review, remember, is wildlife photography centric, not landscape, not wedding, not portrait, none of that stuff. And it's also predicated on how I shoot and how I use the camera. So keep that in mind because not everything I'm going to say about this camera everybody's going to agree on because we all shoot differently and we all have different needs for what we do in wildlife photography. And I also want to say that the most important thing in a camera, what is it? Well, it's the image you get off the camera, or out of the camera. It's the sharpness, the contrast, the colors, all those things. And this camera does just that. The images straight out of this camera are fantastic. Now, I also want to go pass on a little bit of a sage advice that I got a long time ago from somebody. The camera in your hand does not mean you're going to get good images. Your deep understanding of how this camera works or your camera works and further your understanding of photography and further your craft and the subjects you shoot, that's going to produce a great image. So remember that. So no matter how fast the shutter speed is, how good the autofocus is, the color science, you know, all those things we talk about in the camera, and there's reviews and discussing it with your fellow photographers out in the field, it all matters. But if that image coming off this sensor or off this camera, when you pull it off the camera or put it in your computer, it's kind of not, so, it's just so-so, well, it's all for naught, basically, for all those big things. So what I'm getting in with all, getting at with all of this, is the camera may have some flaws or aggravations or just that one little thing that kind of drives you nuts. But again, if at the end of the day that the camera can produce images that are just gorgeous and get it right in camera, well, that's a winner. And that's kind of what this camera does, at least for me. 
So the first thing we'll talk about, as we always do in these uh, reviews, is we talk about how does the camera feel in the hand, how's the ergonomics of the camera. And just like any of the pro bodies with the integrated grips, this Nikon Z9 feels fantastic, either in landscape mode or in portrait mode. It just feels really good and comfortable. There's actually a ton of room also between the lens and the grip where your fingers go, which is really good because there's a few buttons here you need to access the way this camera is set up. We'll get into it in a bit. But even with the fattest lenses I put on here to test with this thing, there was still a ton of room in here for your fingers, which is just great. Uh, the camera is also a chunky boy. Uh, this thing's running in about 2.9 pounds, which is pretty heavy. And when I'm running the uh, 500 F4, that's a seven pound lens. I have about a whole 10 pounds total that I'm carrying around, but I don't really mind that and I've gotten used to it. And to be honest with you, R5 with the battery grip is pretty close to the same weight as this, just a little bit lighter, but not by much. But I don't mind carrying the big rigs. I know a lot of you guys do. The heavier the rig, the harder it is. But it just gives you a chance to you know, just work out those arms and stuff. So not a big deal to me. So the ergonomics would have been a love part of that. This next part I'm going to talk about with the button layout is a little bit of a hate part. Now, it's only for the first month I was using this camera. As I moved along in the next couple of months, I started to get more familiar with the camera and understand how this thing's laid out. So it became less of a hate part. But at first month, this was very aggravating. And what is that? Well, it's because everything on Nikon is opposite and backwards to Canon. So if you're Nikon shooters, this wouldn't bother you at all. But come from Canon into Nikon, everything's backwards. It's just funny. I think the two companies do this on purpose just to be completely different. So the very first thing is about taking the lenses on and off the camera. So when you take the lens off a Nikon, you screw it counterclockwise. When you put it on, it goes clockwise to your right and the left. Can is just the opposite. To take it off, you go right. To put it on, you go left. Just silly. The next thing is where the shutter button is versus the dial. On the Nikon, it goes dial, then shutter. On Canon, it goes shutter, then dial. Your mode dial on the camera. On Canons, are always on the right. This Nikon's on the left. Just, just funny little stuff like that. Uh, the lens release buttons are both on the same side at least, so we got that much going for us. But it's just those silly little things that just kind of crack me up. When I'm taking the uh, lens, the back lens cap off the, uh, the lenses, when I'm back here, since it's backwards and the new Canon RF lenses, when they screw on, they're a little bit tight, so you kind of have to wrench them a little bit, give them a little bit of force to get them off. But since it's the backwards on the Nikon, I have I, one of these days I'm going to break that whole cap off the little in there because I I go to pull them with I'm not pulling hard enough and I wrench it really hard. Eventually I'm going to break one of those caps. It's going to be kind of funny when I do it, but uh, because I'm twist it the wrong way is why. So it's just kind of funny there, not a big deal. Now, as I said before, since these buttons were backwards, I'm always, in, and the uh, shutter button is really flush and really well ma made, that I, at times I have far, if I have gloves on, at first, the first month and a half, I had a hard time finding it because I kept trying to go to the front. I need to go on top to hit the shutter button. With gloves on, I couldn't really feel that button. The Canons have got a little bit of a raise to it, and the Nikon's pretty smooth right there, so it's kind of hard to find that. But again, as I use the camera more often, going between the dials and the shutter button was pretty nice. Now onto the dial, the uh, love-hate part here. I understand, again, you Nikon guys, you gotta bear with me here, because at first, the first month or so, I was not used to how the Nikon cameras shoot and where everything was and how they're set up. You guys that shoot Nikon probably are just so used to that, but I'm not. So the first thing that's interesting is the to change it from single shot, your drive modes, to 10 frames a second, 20 frames a second, and your timer, you control from the dial up here. And once you hit the button, there's a bottom side of this dial that moves back and forth. And that got me once because I had changed the setting on the camera, but somehow, I don't know how, because you have to push this button, it's kind of out of the way to even hit it. I had changed it from H to L, which means I moved it from 20 frames a second to 10 frames a second. But I had made a change in the settings on the camera or something, so when I was shooting, I thought maybe something there caused my frame rate to drop or the battery was dying. And then about a few minutes later, I kind of figured out, I noticed up there, looked up, and that little H was on H, it was on L now. And so I figured, oh, I had changed the mode into low frame rate mode. 
So if you're moving to this camera, not used to it, that's one thing that will got you and watch that. So another thing on the button layout that is actually still kind of a, a hate relationship with this camera, uh, but I've gotten used to it and now it is second nature for me to do it and it's completely different than the Canons, is your dials on the camera. You have one in the front and one in the back to change things. Now those are set to the dials we usually set for Canon and Nikon. As you know, we want to change your aperture, your shutter, or your ISO. And what is really comical to me is the flagship Nikon has two dials. That's it. There's no other dial. There's not another on the back. It's just kind of a D-pad on the back. And the one thing that we gripe about, or Canon shooters gripe about, with the R7 and the R8, is it only has two dials on it. Because Canon shooters get used to always having three dials, that third dial, so you can control all three aspects of your exposure triangle, your aperture, your shutter, and your uh, ISO, all with dials. And here's this camera that doesn't only has two dials, and it's pro body, so you Canon shooters just bag it with the two dial thing. It's kind of funny to me. And I'm one of them, and I gripe about to only have two dials also. Uh, but anyway, with these dials, why I have a little bit of a hate relationship with it is you can only set aperture and shutter with the dials. You cannot change ISO just by turning the dial. There's, you can change it, but you have to do one other thing. There's a button on top called the ISO button, and Canons have them too, but we can remap that button. There is no way that I have found, and if you Nikon shooters know how to do it with the dial, one of these two dials, let me know. But the only way to change your ISO is to push the ISO button, then run the dial on the camera to change your ISO. Now, the first month plus, this is the part about this camera that I cussed about, I cussed about, and every Nikon shooter that was a buddy of mine, I told them, what the heck was Nikon thinking? This is annoying. But they're used to it. That's the way it is for Nikon. But as a Canon shooter coming here, it was very, very frustrating. And... For me, it's even more frustrating because it's how I shoot. So maybe other people wouldn't be a big deal. I shoot totally manual. And as I've said many, many times, I set my aperture and I leave it. It's pretty much gonna be the same for what I'm shooting that day or for that period of time when I've got certain subject. If I do get a different subject where I need to move it off, I'm usually at f4, f5.6, and wide open as I can with that big lens. But if there's times where I need to change it to f8, I'm probably changing it for a long period of time, not a just for a short window. So I don't mess with my aperture. So I set that and leave it. So I don't really need an aperture on the dial. I need that. I can use that somewhere else to change it. Actually, consciously go in, change it, and leave it. Next thing is my shutter speed. Again, I know if I'm going after some birds, I'm going to set it at this shutter speed. If I'm going after fox, I'm set it at this shutter speed. If I'm after other stuff, I know what shutter speed ranges I want to set this in and I set it there and it pretty much leave it for most of the shooting period when I'm out. So 99.9% of the time what I'm working is my ISO. So those two, so I really just need a dial to run my ISO. The other two I really don't touch for most of the time when I'm out shooting. And to have to actually hit an extra button to get to that is a bit annoying to me for this camera. And so when I'm shooting, I've got this thing lined up, I look at it, and normally I just roll the back dial to get my exposure set up the way I want it, the way it looks in the window, the way it looks in the histogram, you know, the way I want to see it, and then I take the shot. And I'm doing that on the fly. Sometimes I'll take underexposed and overexposed, I'll jump them back and forth. With this camera, I have to actually find the thing with my butt finger, which, you know, it's muscle memory. Now my mouse finger goes right to it. I kind of move my finger up there. I feel that uh, record button because it's really raised. And I know it's the button right beside that. So I just kind of find it real quick, hit that. But I have to delay a hair because I got to make sure when I hit that in the window of the EVF, I want to see that go yellow in the bottom right where it says ISO. If I don't see it go yellow, I don't turn the dial. And that just hinders me for just, just a hair. But you know, that hair could be the difference of getting good exposure as a bird coming in flight or moving around or having to like I did with the otters where I'm jumping from over here where I have to decrease it and have to jump over here where I have to increase the ISO. So that little bit of hesitation could be a problem by hitting that button or finding that button or missing the button, especially if I've got gloves on it's extremely freezing like it was today. And I actually froze my hand off by having the glove on and off, on and off all day. But yeah, that's uh, one of the hate relationships with this camera. Now, I've gotten used to it. It's second nature. And a couple times with the Canon camera, I've looked for the ISO button. But once I remember what I'm on and I get my fingers start feeling the cameras, I kind of know which camera I have in my hand 
it's just become muscle memory of time of using a camera. So remember, put the time on the camera and then you'll be set up for success with your camera. Uh, it, just, it just takes time, right, to get that muscle memory down. Next thing, that's a little bit of a hate relationship for the first month as time figured out when I figured out how to use this camera, and that was back button focus. There's only one button on the back to set up for focus. Now again, if you can, guys, know of a way for two buttons that you can set. Now they have to be right of the viewfinder where my thumb would be, right? Don't give me one that's on the left or somewhere or on the front because I've got, that's how I got my setup going now, in the back. But there's only one that I know of. So how I have this camera set is the AF on button on the back is set to my eye autofocus, whatever method. So it's gonna be 3D tracking or it's gonna be auto area AF. One of those, those are the only two I use on this camera. I don't use any little boxes or anything. Those are the two I use. So how do I get my single point? Which you know, if you've watched any of my videos, what I want is something that looks through the frame and also want a single point where I tell it where the focal plane goes. So what I've had to do on this camera is I've had to map this front FN1 button. And that one there is going to be, as I'm holding this camera, index finger on the shutter, of course thumb here in the back, run the focus, and then my middle finger here, I'm not going to give that to you, but sometimes I want to give it to this camera or the wildlife, is the FN1 button. Now I want to say I do love this camera, so don't get that wrong. There's some things about it that do aggravate me as being a Canon shooter moving a Nikon. Again, I'll say it a hundred times, you Nikon guys were telling me, hey, you're silly, you're being a whiner. But anyway, that's where my single point focus is on FN1. So I've gotten really used to uh, doing that. And a couple times on the Canon, when I've used this for days and I go back to the R7, I'll, I'll no I'll, and notice the grip feels different when I think about single point. I actually have to think about it for a millisecond when I first pick the camera up. Then I'm going, okay, I'm on the R7, so it's going to be on the back. But, yeah, so that's a little bit of a hindrance there. I, I don't like it, but I've gotten used to it. And I now my brain, when it's saying go single point, my fingers are doing what they need to do. So again, muscle memory time on camera. So the next thing on this camera, it's not a love nor a hate, it's just what it is. And that is the movie to stills changer. I, I do like it that it's a, it's a flip, just a one flip over from, from stills to, to movie. Uh, it is a little stiff, which is good, so you don't bump it accidentally. It is kind of in a weird spot. And it's just kind of sometimes when I'm looking through the viewfinder, when I go to hit it, it it's um, I'm clumsy to find it. Um, because what I'm doing, most of you guys aren't doing, I'm jumping from stills to video a lot, uh, especially when, in, when I was doing the otters, when I was sitting on the ice for that otter video. I was constantly flipping back and forth, and sometimes I was trying to find that, but especially if I had my gloves on but it works pretty good. Uh, the joystick on this thing is fantastic, works really good. It's pretty fast, pretty responsive. Uh, the one thing I, I probably need to set on this camera, like I said, there's several things I need to still get set even after three months because I just don't take the time to go set them. I think about why I'm shooting. I need to go when I get home, change that. And it's when you push in this joystick, what I'd like to do is like the Canon does, like I have it set there where it will jump back to the center for that focus method um, where that point is. Because if you watch the River Hour video, one of the things I talked about is I got that focus point in the bottom right, and I was wanting to use 3D focus, but since it's down here on the right, anytime I hit 3D, it was trying to find something that was down there in the bottom right corner rather than when I was trying to look at something in the middle. A uh, bit of an issue. Other good things on it, the diopter dial is real easy to get to. On the Canons, it's very annoying because it's usually down here by the bottom of the viewfinder somewhere where it's, it's really hidden, which is good so you don't bump it. But it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to push, especially in the R7. It's a pain in the butt. It's really hard to get hold of. This was a big dial here on the side, which is really, really nice to change that diopter. So if you don't know what the diopter is, because uh, some people may not, that's just like your doctor when he changes, the eye doctor when he changes it, go, okay, better or worse, better or worse. That's kind of what this is doing. So when you look through, get focus on this, on your camera, go ahead and find something at your house, set the focus, you know, hit the autofocus where it grabs it and then move the diopter until everything looks perfectly crisp and clear. And that's how you set your diopter on the cameras. So a little bit of a tip there. So another thing on the love-hate relationship was a hate at start, but it's gotten better over time, was the SD card slot door. This guy is hard to open. If you have it at the wrong angle, it is hard to open. You gotta get the, for me to get it at the right angle, and I just did it there, to get it open. You have to pull this down and you have to push really hard to get that to pop out. 
So why I disliked that was because it was so hard to open. It's not just like a real simple like can and pop them open. It's really stiff. Now, as I found out from folks, the reason that's stiff is because of the way they've done the water sealing on this door. And I've never had water get in besides a camera that completely went dunked completely in the water uh, for any water that got in the SD card slot. But I bet with this one, the way it's built, went so hard to get out of there. I mean, I have to really push it hard to get open. Even if I dunk in the water, it's probably not getting water in there. So again, I hate it because it's so hard to open, but I also love it because I know it's gonna add extra protection. So that's a really weird one. Another thing you wanna make sure you do with this camera is, and it's kind of a love-hate relationship here too also, and it's the same with any battery grip, integrated battery grip or a battery grip that has the shutter button here as you go portrait mode, is to make sure, like right now, it is not locked. You have to make sure it's locked. Now this thing, if you don't have it locked, while well, I'm saying that, you can be walking around and the way I do with my hand, sometimes the, the base of my hand will hit that button, take a picture, or when I'm moving the camera around, grabbing it or on the strap, I'll hear that shutter button when I don't have it locked, I hear a and I'm probably rattled off 60, 80 pictures that I gotta either at that point go through and delete, or later I've gotta go through, I got these all these pictures of the ground or my pocket or my coat or something. So it's very annoying. And that and that's not just a Nikon thing, that's any integrated grip or any battery grip you add to it, you gotta make sure. Canon's is a little more, uh, the button to, it has an on off toggle, and it's pretty, it's pretty obvious you got it on or off which I don't know which one I like better because with the Canon, you have to fl actually physically flip it on and off. It's like a dial. It's just really, it's, you have to physically really think about it to do it. It's good because it's off and you don't accidentally take pictures because most of the time I'm probably 80% in land, uh, landscape mode instead of portrait. But I do like the Nikon too because when I go to landscape mode, if I've had it off, and I, because I, you know, about 20% of the time I may go into portrait mode. So I'm in a landscape, I flip over to this, and I hit it, and nothing happens. Still, right where my shutter is, I can turn that on and off right there, turn it on or lock it. With the Canon, I would have to go over here and you, you can't just do it with your fingertip. You would have to use two fingers to actually turn it for all the ones I have anyway, to turn to lock it and unlock it or turn it on and off. So it's a little bit of a love-hate relationship with, uh, it is easy to move and you can bump it and you can take a lot of shots. And it's also a love relationship with, you know, you can do it real quickly with just one finger. So it's really good. So it's a little up and down on that one. Now to the LCD screen on the back. I do love it. Um, some people will say, oh, it's not good because you can't swing it out here when you're going towards the lens, you know, if you're doing stuff like this, filming yourself and you want to see what's going on there. They want to know why didn't it flip out. Well, this camera's not really made for that. It's not a creator camera. You're not going to walk around like this or you're not going to film yourself a lot and need to see that. And if you are, just get an Atomos or some type of external screen uh, monitor so you can see yourself or something else if you're going to do that. But what it does do good is flip out and go into all the different ways you want to see it. It works really good. So when you're wanting to shoot really low, you're wanting to look down on this instead of having to get on the ground and get it to your eye. If you want to just look here to get your shots. And also when you want to go portrait mode with your shots, this thing folds out really, really well, this screen. Now these little, it is, I almost feel over-engineered with all these little hinges and things that pop out, but, and it almost makes me feel like I'm gonna bend this metal in here, but it is pretty rigid, and I haven't bent it yet, so I'm probably not gonna bend it. Now, I don't use that a lot. I go ahead and usually just get on the ground, but there are times when I just wanna take a quick shot that flipping this out is really good when I'm just wanting to get a couple shots, or maybe just on the roadway with this wide angle, you know, some something I don't show you guys on this channel, and if I do any landscape stuff, I don't do very much. But if I even I'm shooting an animal, a moose or something, I want to get low just for a couple shots, I can flip this out, drop it down, and it's really good. It's engineered very well. It's actually, to be honest with you, for doing that thing to real quickly jump down for these type shots where you're got it out like this, where you're shooting landscape. I like this a little bit better than I like the Canon. Now, they're both just as good when I go into portrait mode. And uh, the Canon's really good. And this one's really good when you go into portrait mode. So they're both about that. I think the, the Nikon wins a little bit more with the type of flippy screen it is when you're in landscape mode. 
The uh, another thing about this camera that I thought I didn't have a problem with until just a couple days ago was a lot of guys said this little ring on the eyepiece would come off. And I was like, that's kind of silly. Mine hadn't done a bit. Well, just a couple days ago, I noticed that the, this left side, I'm seeing that little ring. It's like a little O-ring is what this thing is. Uh, start to gasket, starting to come off there a little bit. So uh, I kind of pushed it back down there best I can, but I can still tell it's a little bit off. So yeah, that is a little bit of a hindrance. So there would be a hate piece right there too with that eyepiece. What I will probably do is there's an eye cup that you can put on here that just kind of covers this. You know, if you've got it up your eye, it'll actually cover this side of your eye. They don't make one for the Canon R5. And I think if you heard me in the video, if you're shooting in bright light and the light's coming from this side and you're up here, it's just like your phone. You get glare in that window on the EVF and it's kind of hard to see. So to fix this O-ring piece, I'll probably buy that little cup for the Nikon. It's only like $15 or so or $19 put on here. And that way I can keep that and I won't have this O-ring problem anymore. But again, back to the buttons, there is a ton of customizable buttons on this camera. So you can customize buttons all over the front. You can customize a few on the back. So you can go nuts with the customization on this thing. So just like all your modern mirrorless cameras, you can really, really customize this to Sunday if you want to. Now, another button on this camera, and again, you Nikon guys tell me if there's other ways, and I'm sure there is, is your AF area selection. So Again, you know me, I want to have all area and then I want to have single point. But with Nikon, you have two area modes or eye focus modes you use. One of them's 3D tracking, which we'll talk about here in a second. And the other one's auto area AF. That's the two I use. I don't use any of the little boxes and stuff because auto area AF looks through all those boxes in terms of which one. So it works a lot like the Canon when a bird's flying through the screen, it will grab it. And that's usually what I use it for, auto area AF, is when things fly through the screen. The second one's 3D tracking. So if I have a post here and I have a otter here, because we had the otter videos, if I put the focus point closer to the otter, it's going to find the otter's eye. It's going to try to find it or the body. If I put the focus point closest to the post, an object, any object, it's going to grab that post. It's going to lock on where I put that focus point. No matter where I move the camera, as long as I hold that focus button down on 3D, it's going to stay on it, same as the otter's eye. So that's what's really cool about Nikon with that 3D tracking. It's really sticky. No matter what you put it on, it'll, it'll stay on there pretty hard. And the, again, the auto area AF, that's for anything flying, moving, things like that. But to change between those two modes, I know I could program a button to jump between the two, but what? But that'd be on the front, that'd be the same problem I'm gonna have here real quick, is that button's here on the left side. So one of the things that I do is, is if you're holding the camera, you're always holding the camera with your right hand on here for your shutter and your ISO, your aperture, whatever you're getting here. The other camera on those big lenses, or all wildlife lenses, is usually down here on the bottom of the lens, holding and supporting the lens. Since this, normally, on other cameras, you have that second button back here, or you have a way, like with the Canon, you have a button to go between your AF area mode. You can hit it, cycle it, or you can hit it and change that real quickly with the dials in the viewfinder. With this camera, since this button's on the left side to change your autofocus area points, you have to take your hand off the camera base, put it over here and hit it. At that point, now you've lost any stability with your camera, you're not holding it here anymore and you're taking time away from what you're doing to come over here to change your mode, you hit that button and then you roll the dial in the front to change it from 3D to auto area AF. So the thing is that I don't like is I have to take my hand off here, go here, set it, and then back here. So it's kind of a, what I want to do is I want to be in the viewfinder with my eye and doing my right hand what I want, my left hand stabilizing to where I need to be shooting. It's kind of like the focal point of what I shoot. So by having to move my hand off of that, I'm losing a little bit of time. And remember, fractions of a second. If I've been shooting otter and an eagle comes by, like what happened in that otter video, when I swing up here, I'm 3D tracking, I've got to hit that eagle in the sky, kind of like the old DSLRs are, or I'm not going to get that focus hitting it. But if I have an auto area, I could change that real quick, like I can with the Canon real quick. And I'm sure there's a way to do it. You guys, Nikon guys will tell me how in the comments. I know you will. I would be able to go that quicker. I know there's a way, I just haven't gone and tried to figure it out yet. 
but that's the default way to hit that button on the left. So that's another little hey relationship I have with getting between the two focus modes. Now let's talk about the EVF, the viewfinder on this camera. It is fantastic, I love it. It's extremely bright, extremely detailed. All the information is in there. I can customize any of the information inside of that window to be how I want it. And how you do that on this camera, just like the Canons are, you hit the, and Canon hit info, this one you hit the DISP display, and you just cycle through them until you get the one you want. A lot of times I'll have it up there and I realize my histogram's not in the window. Just hit that DISP button a few times there, and it'll pop up in there so you can see it. Same with the Canon, go through the info button, it'll scroll through in your viewfinder to get that histogram. Histogram on a mirrorless is super fantastic to have and super important to have to make sure you've got your exposure. Not only are you seeing the exposure in an EVF on a mirrorless camera, you can also see your histogram to make sure it's not lying, your eye is not lying to you. So if you say there and say, hey, that looks really good, but you look down at that histogram and say, hey, it's not far enough right or not far enough left for my darks or my brights or my whites, then you can adjust it there and don't let your eye lie to you. Same goes for the LCD on the back. It's extremely bright, extremely colorful. It reacts really well to the touch. The, the touch screen is really fantastic on this. Works good to pinch in, zoom, touch things, all that kind of stuff. So again, the EVF and the LCD are fantastic on this camera. Really bright, really easy to see. Clear, clear as a bell. So the next thing on this camera is to the battery. And the battery on this guy is massive. Just like on the flagship Canon cameras, this is a huge battery, and it's an expensive battery. This battery runs about $220, so when I bought a backup one the other day, I cried a little bit. But it is fantastic. It lasts for an extremely long time in normal shooting conditions. Even with, the, uh, with shooting the otters, it drained faster, but not that much faster. It went through a lot of action for it. lasted, this same battery lasted almost the whole day. And actually, I'd used it the two days prior for just a little bit, so it actually would have lasted the whole day. I did have to change it out towards the end of the day. But the battery life on this guy is fantastic, and it's a big battery. One of the things I really love on this camera also is the HDMI port on the side. And from a Canon shooter, that's the one thing about Canon that really makes me mad on the Canon cameras. This is a full-size HDMI port. Canon, get with game. Put a full-size HDMI on this one. The Canons all have that micro HDMI cable, and I have broke so many of those cables because it's real flimsy, those micro HDMI cables. You can't get a one. When you get these full sizes, you get ones that are pretty much a, just a brick. They're not gonna bend. And I ought to collect the Canon cables that I broke and just put them in a pile and see how many over time I could stack up. And I'm breaking one of those over several months because I'll either be setting the camera down doing something and it'll fall over a little bit, just bend that cable a little bit and then they eek, just bends, broke. And I've been dead in the water a couple times where I couldn't use my Atomos or anything I'm recording because I broke the cable and I was out of them. So that is really fantastic on this camera. Another cool thing this camera has over the Canon cameras, and I believe the Sony, you Sony shooters, correct me if I'm wrong here, is when you have something plugged in the HDMI out, like you're at the Atomos when I'm recording what you guys see, the viewfinder for you guys, or this external monitor, is you can still see what's in your EVF when that's running the whole time. With Canon, when you got that running, you can't see the viewfinder. So when I'm out shooting birds in flight and doing tutorials, this is so much better with this camera than it is with the Canon, because with the Canon, I put the Atomos on, I have to look at the Atomos, so I gotta do this number trying to shoot. When I put it on the Nikon, I can go ahead and pull this up to my eye, do what I'm shooting like natural. So it's more of a natural because trying to find a bird, looking through the back screen here, actually you can't see your LCD either. You can only see the Atomos that's on top. With this camera, you can see if you're holding away from you, you can see the LCD or you can look through the viewfinder and see what's in the viewfinder. And trying to track a bird in flight by doing this is extremely, extremely hard and it's a pain in the butt. And it's not natural to show you guys bird in flight for a Canon camera. So when you guys ask about bird in flight and I'm using the Canon trying to show you, I, I, I might just, I do this because I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so hard to catch, especially a fast bird. A slow moving gull, yeah, that's easy. So yeah, that part is fantastic. So I like it because you'll probably see me get more EVF footage on this camera and mount in the field than I for sure will with the Canon because it's more natural with what I'm trying to do, trying to get a good shot. If I've got that Atomos on the Canon, I'm probably doing it for demonstration purpose, not I'm actually out really trying to get a wall hanger shot. So that is a difference there. So check mark to the Nikon for sure. So let's talk about the image quality of this camera. It is fantastic. 
As I said before, right off the start of this video, I get more pictures off this camera right in camera than I've ever had done before. And again, it's because I'm using a, the first time in my career, a flagship sensor. Well, you know, no matter which brain manufacturer is a flagship sensor, so it ought to be the best sensor they have at the time for that camera. And I get them right in camera. And what I mean by getting them right in camera, if you've watched the Fox video, in that, the stills I got out of those that were in the video, the editing on that was super minimal. I did not mask the Fox. I didn't mask anything out. All I did to those images was I recropped them. I may put them 16.9 because of you know the wide format I have to do for YouTube. And I may have moved them a little bit to get the rule of thirds closer where I, where I liked it aesthetically looking the way it was cropped. And the cropping was very small also. The only thing I did those images, I adjusted the white balance. I probably bumped it 20 to 30 and that's it on the warmth. That was all I did to those images. I should have posted the raw and the end and I may do that in another video when I talk about maybe a little bit more about the image quality of this guy. But almost nothing I had to do to those images and they were fantastic to me and that thrilled me to no end. So for the sensor, that is fantastic. Uh, the second part about the sensor, we're talking about readout speed. We'll get into that more when we talk about autofocus on this camera. Low light performance, it's not much difference than the R5. They're both 45 megapixels. The low light on both of them are fantastic. Uh, being that it has no mechanical shutter, which we'll talk a little bit again when we get into frame rate, you think that would affect the, the low light. It really doesn't. Um, both cameras, you have to, Canon and Nikon, especially these higher megapixels, they both have to be run through DxO for my workflow process. When I compare these images to the R5, you know, just flat raw out of the camera at the same, I was curious what, you know, what the noise looked like, and they were pretty close on the noise level. And I ran the images out of this, the NEF files that come off this for the images for Nikon, and I put them in Lightroom, looked at them just straight there, and I put them through Nikon software that comes with the camera. And again, just like the Canon DPP and DxO, or sorry, Lightroom, I noticed that the Nikon software and the Canon software with the images coming off either one of the cameras looked good as far as noise. I put them straight into Lightroom, looked like crap, so I ran them through DxO. They look just like they do in the native Nikon software. So my advice, if you're running this camera, run this thing through DxO. Another tip about DxO, real quick. I had some people talking about and messaged me privately about they weren't as happy with DxO, thought it was doing a lot of uh, warpy image stuff or doing some weird stuff. So two things you need to make sure is make sure you're shooting uncompressed for Canon and lossless for Nikon on your RAW. Do not shoot C-RAW, do not shoot lossy compression. If you do that on either camera, DxO is not going to fully process that noise and all the other stuff. The second thing on that, if you still think it's doing that, turn off the global sharpening and turn it off the lens correction on that. If you do those two things, you shouldn't see anything other than putting the proper color profile and doing the proper noise reduction into the image. But for personally, I haven't had any problems. I, with Topaz, I, I have no way to turn that sharpening off if I run it through the denoise. You can set it to zero, but it still sharpens, I've noticed. So I do like that I can turn the sharpening off on DxO. So enough about the DxO and Topaz. I, I still have both. I still pay for both. And other times, if I can't get it through DxO using it in Photoshop and Lightroom and I got to denoise it more, it has to be a super special image for me to take it into Topaz to do one more level. Because if I didn't, I, I probably got 50 of the same shot somewhere else. I can find a cleaner one. All right, let's talk about frame rate on this camera. The frame rate on this camera is fantastic. Uh, it shoots up to 20 frames a second in RAW. I'm not gonna talk about the 120 frames a second. I'm gonna get up to that because that's shooting in JPEG. I always shoot lossless RAW or uncompressed RAW. And the reason I do that, again, like I talked a minute ago about DxO to be able to push it through there. Plus I want every bit of that information that I've got in that. And by doing that, I get all that information. Uh, this is a stack sensor, so the sensor readout is extremely fast. I don't know what it is at the top of my head. I may pop it up here, what the readout speed is if I think about it in post. Uh, but it's fantastic. And since it has a stack sensor, it's extremely fast. I can whip pan, do all those things, and not worry about rolling shutter, which is really, really good. 
Um, like I said, I haven't tried the JPEG mode with 120 frames a second because I just don't shoot JPEG. I haven't had a use case for it yet. I also haven't tried out the pre-burst on this one, like, you know, but I've tried it out on the Canons and it works really good. I'm sure it works about the same. I haven't tested it because I haven't had anything really, a use case to even try to test it yet because I haven't really had any birds that are flying in and out that I consistently can test this out on. Once spring hits her a little bit here in a month or two, I will do a video about the raw burst mode or the pre-burst mode, whatever it's called on this camera, versus the Canon and see how it works, see how well it is, and, and we'll do a little comparisons too for giggles. But uh, yeah, but I just haven't had a chance to test that out. All right, now let's get into the elephant in the room, probably the main reason why most of you tuned into this video, to see a Canon shooter like me discuss how the autofocus is on the Nikon Z9. And I want to first kind of baseline a little bit. A little less than three years ago, if you're a Nikon or Canon shooter, we didn't have animal eye detect or any of the autofocuses like that on these cameras. How we had it, we had a nine point box or a square box that as a bird went in flight through us, we had to try to get that box or that nine point on the bird to hit the autofocus to lock it and try to stay on that, keep that focus point of the bird through the whole time we're trying to shoot. And the guys that could get that consistently were good. And it took a lot of practice to get erratic birds, diving birds, all those kind of things. So why I'm saying that is in 2023, all these cameras from Canon and Nikon, we are extremely spoiled as photographers and we're really lucky to be doing photography in this day and age where we have these type of features. And that is where I want to kind of baseline this. Now, back to what I think of the autofocus on this thing. The first few weeks, the first month I had this camera, I cussed the autofocus on this up and down and up and down. Why? I was expecting what was in the, the Canon and trying to use this camera like the Canon, which I couldn't because their autofocus systems work completely differently. Second thing was, I just didn't understand the autofocus modes that were on this camera and I had to learn them just like anybody else would as I, I had to break the Canon habit and get into the Nikon habit. And as I discussed before, the two types of focus you do on the animal tech was the 3D and the whole area audio, and they were auto and they work differently, right? So when to use each one of them was confusing me. So the very first outing I took this in the field, I was on a fox, and it's golden hour sun setting. And I hit the autofocus on there and I got a little aggravated with it because I had whole area on, I should have been in 3D. It was still grabbing the fox, but it didn't look like it was grabbing it right. At least I thought at the time and I was pretty perturbed with it. But when I got home, and the back of the camera, the picture looked pretty good, but I, you know, again, when you zoom in, you think, hey, yeah, I got a tax chart. You still don't know until you get home and put it on the computer. I get home, put that picture on the computer. All the pictures were in focus. It grabbed the right spot. And that image looked beautiful. The way the light, all the things I was talking about with the Nikon sensor, how well it captured the light that was falling across that fox. And when I was out in the field for those times, fighting the autofocus because I was fighting it, not working with it. I really regretted my purchase at times. I was like, wow, what did I do? Did I really mess this up? But as I used the autofocus and also as the patches came out, the autofocus got better. Now, a lot of you guys will say also, well, it's because you're using a Frankenstein setup with the Fringer adapter with the 500 F4 or the 7200 a lot of times, and you're also using a two to 500 lens, which is a cheaper lens for Nikon. Well, I've also tested the 400-4.5, the 500-5.6, the F-Lens, and I've also tested a 600-F4. And in my testing with those cameras and lenses, the autofocus grabbed just as fast on the Canon Big Whites as they did on the 400 and the 500. I'll, I'm going to do a full video about testing the autofocus between the Z, the, probably the Z9 and probably the R3 or the R5. We'll do that in a separate video here, probably in about a month and we'll look at how fast and in which situations that one or the other will do better or worse than the other. We'll do a full video on that. I'm not really comparing that to that. I'm really telling you how this autofocus works right now. But like I'm saying, using my big whites with the Fringer adapter, using the Z lenses and using the F mounted lenses, they were so close in speed and acquisitions of focus and things like that, that it was extremely hard to even tell the difference of how quick they were grabbing it. They're both grabbing extremely fast for how this autofocus works. But what I think after three months of using this camera and several Nikon updates that hit this camera and the firmware for the autofocus, I think it's really good. And I think I'm really starting to understand how to use the autofocus on this camera and which types of autofocus to use in what situations. 
like I said, with the 3D tracking and the auto area AF, which one to use for di different situations. But it works really good in almost most situations. There's some times where this will struggle, and those times are when it's got an animal that it doesn't recognize quite yet. Kind of like a doll sheep when it's at distance. When a doll sheep's closer and it can see more of the animal, then it has no problem figuring out whether it's an animal and finding the parts of the body. But it's farther down the hill, it has a little bit of problem. Or when it's really busy, an animal is really busy out there, it still has a little more problems finding it sometimes. But with doll sheep, it doesn't know what a doll sheep is. I think that's the biggest problem. But when I pick up the Canon R7 or something and flip it up there with the same focal length, it just jumps right to the head because the Canon software now knows more what that subject is versus the Nikon one. But that's an odd circumstance that most of you are gonna run into. But birds, for the most part, fox, et cetera, it recognizes the distance and does pretty good. And again, like I said, if things are closer to the camera for those oddball animals, it will pick them up also. But the, I guess what you want to know is the Nikon Z9 autofocus as good as the Canon's autofocus? Well, like I said before, that's kind of a loaded question because of what we were just talking about with the different models loaded into it. And they're just not the same autofocuses. They operate extremely different. And in a future video, when I go, I'm gonna do a test of this camera with like a 600 F4 Nikon lens, and probably an R5, R3 with a Canon big white lens. We'll do the test and we'll talk more in specific of how this autofocus works in its technical specs versus how the Canon's autofocus works and maybe make more sense. And we'll do those speed tests at different subjects of how quick it acquires. I'm sure you guys will really wanna see that video. And I'm sure there's a few out there like it right now, but we're, I'm gonna get a Nikon buddy of mine and we're gonna shoot both cameras the same subject and we're gonna look at that. And him, the reason I'm gonna grab him is he's shot Nikon forever. So it'll help me overcome the things that you Nikon guys are telling me I'm doing wrong on this camera. And that way he's gonna answer those questions and make sure we have a good test on the autofocus systems, both of them right there. Now back to, is it as good? I would say from shooting this for three months and shooting Canons forever and shooting for the last couple of years, three years using the, uh, the new Canon autofocus systems, Canon's autofocus is a touch faster at initial acquisition, especially for things like birds in flight. Now, if it's a fox sitting on the ground or an otter across the creek and things that aren't extremely far away, both cameras are extremely fast at grabbing the animal and grabbing the eye right there. Just, just in that discussion right there. When an animal, it can see enough contrast. Remember, you gotta have the proper exposure on your subject also. If you're extremely washed out or extremely dark or extremely busy, both cameras are gonna have problems acquiring it. And those are the times probably you'll notice the difference of the two when you have those type of situations going on. But if you've got your exposure pretty good, where it's got a pretty good contrast, where the camera can detect what it's seen, then both of them at shorter distances and closer to the camera, work extremely fast, extremely well. And both of them, when they lock on, they're sticky. This thing, once it's locked on 3D whole area, it's, it's really sticky once it locks. I'm really happy with that. Where the Canon is quicker to me, small birds in flight, things at a farther distance that are recognized quicker. So it'll grab it quick. And the Canon, the Nikon may take just a second to grab it. That's, that's where I'm seeing the difference in the two. And that's after learning how to use it, using it longer. So the autofocus is good on this camera. Still lagging just a little bit behind Canon, but Canon had longer to work on this than Nikon has. And Nikon's been making some really fast, quick jumps to catch up in that regard. When I was shooting those otters today, I didn't have any problem with autofocus. A couple times I get the red boxes, but that's because the animal, all I'm seeing maybe is the tail of it and there's water next to it. So both cameras would have lost it right there. But once the head came up or more of the body was there, this thing jumped right back on, which you can see in these examples, hopefully I'm playing right now to show you. But the autofocus was doing, has been doing really well. And really, the difference in the two cameras, I guess I would say, if I'm shooting my Canon cameras, I'm not even thinking about autofocus. I just know it's gonna hit, unless I have multiple, then I may have some, you know, I've gotta make sure which, which one I'll grab. But I know when I pick it up, the autofocus is gonna be there. With this camera, I know it's gonna be there, but I still have a touch of doubt in my head. And that's because of the problems I had when I first got the camera. But when I was shooting the otters, I really stopped thinking about the autofocus, I do, because of just getting it. So over time, getting confidence in your camera, remember I talked about the very beginning of this whole video, 
understanding your camera in depth is where you're going to get good images. Not understanding your camera, like the first month I had this camera, I didn't understand it as well. I was struggling and I was aggravated. So putting time into your camera and on your camera is where you're going to get good images. And with this flagship, it produces fantastic images. So the bottom line on the Nikon Z9 and the autofocus is it's great. It's pretty good. So the bottom line on the autofocus on the Nikon Z9 is pretty great. It's really good. It's not quite to the love state with me yet, but it's in the highly affectionate state with me right now. And I'm sure once I load the 3.01 in whatever future states that Nikon puts out on firmware, which they're doing really good at putting updates to this camera, it's going to enter that love state. And I know I'm getting closer to it because like today with the otters I was talking about, I stopped thinking about the autofocus today. Probably one of the first times I really wasn't thinking about autofocus or seeing where that gold box mixture is locking on. I wasn't paying much attention to it because early in the day when I first hit those otters, it was locking onto the eye or the head of the body like I was expecting. This kind of, like the Canada's really, really quick. And I stopped thinking about it because I knew when I hit that button, it was going to lock on where it was unless I just saw it well off in some wild place, which happened a couple times with some sticks in the wrong place, which happens in my Canon cameras too. So I know I'm getting closer and closer to that love state with the autofocus on this camera, which is really, really good. So you Nikon guys, yes, you're not quite to the Canon. You're close. You're real close, at least with your cameras. But it's still phenomenal autofocus. And only if I tell you your autofocus is not as good as Canon, it's not as good, but it doesn't have to be because it's already doing what you need it to do. I guess that's my bottom line on this camera. Now to the menus on this camera, if you're still around after the autofocus discussion, and however long this video is, hopefully it's not that long, but I bet it's going to be, uh, is the menus, and this is, yes, this is kind of not really a hate, but it's a pretty aggravating part of the relationship with this camera. And it's because I just can't get my brain around the way Nikon does their menus. And that is possibly due to, I when I want to do one thing that I'm used to doing in a Canon camera, I have to do in three places in the Nikon menu. I've got to go to the picture menu, the setup menu, and the edit menu, I believe. I think it's the edit function button menu. There's three menus I got to go to to do one thing. So that part is pretty aggravating with me. Over time, I can find the places where in the menu I want to change these are. So that's why I haven't done a setup video on this camera because I, some of the things I just can't remember exactly where I set them up in the menus. And I'm afraid when I go write all those down to make the video, when I reset the camera to go back and set it up, I'm gonna miss something in this camera. So I'm still looking at ways to, do I have it set up right? And what all did I change from the default on this camera versus the customization I did. So once I get that, I'll make that video on how I have this camera set up again. Again, it's how I shoot and it's what, how I do it. So that's how I have the camera set up for what I need to shoot with. Okay, the Frankenstein setup. How's it working out? Working out extremely well. I've AB'd the 404.5 Z lens and the uh, 500 PF lens with the F mount and the 100 to 400 Z lens from Nikon to my 500 F4 and my 7200. EF lenses, the Canon lenses, and in A, B, and those things going back and forth, they're both so extremely close on the speed of acquisitions and the motors jumping to where it's supposed to be because when the autofocus says it, the motor still has to jump and stay on that. It does stay on it with the Frankenstein setup. It doesn't wobble. You can see the burst rate and all the videos I've done so far. There's no jumping of the focus. It works really good. So the Frankenstein setup to this day is still hooked up really well. And of course, with the big white lens I have, as we say, if I had a 600 F4 or 500 F4 by Nikon, those elements on those versus the PF lenses is just much more superior. So the lens image quality I'm getting is much better than those PFs of the 1 to 400 Zs. But the, the speed of grabbing it in the motor is what we're really worried about. And those are so close, I can barely tell the difference. We will go A, B those in a full video in the future so you can see for yourself but I'm extremely happy with the Frankenstein setup and that has not affected my autofocus quality or my image quality whatsoever. Actually, the big whites by Canon are gonna be a lot better quality than, and as far as the same as the Nikon 500 4, 600 F4, 4028, are a much better quality lens than the PF lenses that Nikon has in the Z and the 100 400. So you're gonna expect better image quality out of those. 
So do I regret picking up the Z9? That's the final question here. And the answer is no, I don't regret it. Now the first week or so, yeah, I was kind of questioning my sanity why I picked this up because it was giving me fits. But more time on the camera, the better the autofocus got through firmware, my understanding of the autofocus, the image is right out of camera, how fantastic they are using a ProLine sensor. Uh, no, I don't regret it. And a couple other things it does, now that I have the Z9, I can actually honestly and informally discuss differences and how to use the Nikon and how to use the Canon, the difference in the two. The big dilemma I'm gonna have is the farther out it takes to get that R1 out. And if it's late 2024, it's gonna make it even harder because I'll have more time on this camera. And it's gonna be hard to decide, do I give up this camera? I'm gonna buy the R1, don't, don't forget that. But it's gonna be harder to decide, do I give up this camera or not? So that's gonna be the hard decision. And with all these Nikon lenses they keep putting out, that makes the decision even harder. So Canon, come on, get your act together. The PF lenses, the 404.5, the 500p6 NF mount, you guys need some lens like that because that is a fantastic lens and extremely light. Uh, we'll see what Canon does with their lenses. So my recommendation on this camera, it's a great camera. If you're in the market, if you're a Nikon shooter and you're in the market for a Proline camera, this thing can't be beat. Fantastic camera, fantastic images. If you're a Canon shooter, you're on the fence about moving, switching to Nikon or Sony or whatever, just think about the whole system you're gonna switch out. Now, if you wanna do the hybrid system like I'm doing to pick up the Z9 and use the Fringer adapter, the Fringer is the only one I tested that I really like. The other adapters, I wasn't really happy with them, but the Fringer one works exactly like a Nikon lens would work. Yeah, it's worth dipping your toes in. Go rent the camera and play with it a little bit. But if you're a Canon shooter moving to Nikon, it's gonna frustrate you. But it is a fantastic wildlife camera. It is fantastic. And uh, yeah, I couldn't be happier. So yes, this camera went from almost a hate, stream aggravation, but it's moved over to the love category for me. So yes, I love my Nikon Z9, but I also like my love my R7, I love my R5. They're all great cameras. But yeah, great camera. So as always, guys, if you like this video and you've enjoyed watching it, please like, subscribe. Try to watch the videos all the way through. That just helps out the algorithm for promoting this to other people so they can see the content also. And you can also join the channel or leave a super thanks, things like that just help out. So until the next time, the next video, guys, you stay safe and go run that shutter.